the end times like the poor are always either with us or lurking somewhere out of sight overshadowed by the things we rely on for our sense of permanence and like the poor they command the attention of the wise and also of Jesus if the New Testament's anything to go by. To take the Bible as scripture means it's not single use. It's not exhausted by any connection to particular crises a couple of thousand years ago. If Jesus resurrected is with us to the end of the age, then we can do better than being a Jesus memorial society. God in creation sustains all life with the turning of the seasons, the cycles of water and carbon and more. God with humanity tells and retells the stories that we become. The internet age of course sharpens our reading of scripture at a moment's notice we can gobble up any given version of the Bible and compare its flavour with a whole spectrum of others. That's so very different in tone and agenda. Which is the right one? Well, do I absolutely have to wait for a green Bible where every sentence has been chewed over before committing it to print? Or is it sufficient instead that a worshipping community approaches on the hoof whatever we do have with a respectful awareness of the agendas and context and faith with which any given printed version was moulded? And gaining confidence from that awareness, seek the spiritual responsiveness to do likewise for our time and place. Maybe a definitive green Bible would be nice and save us time, as indeed would a more obviously green church, but we'd still be tempted to feel we'd been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It might be one more of those fatal steps which comfort, comfort God's people so much that they sit on their complacent and comfortable backsides as salvation walls not just surround them but crumble around them. Isaiah's comfort is for action not for rest and whatever else Christianity is built on from the start as followers of Jesus we live through actively inspired recycling and repurposing. Now the first shaping and writing down of the Gospel of Mark was likely influenced by the bloodbath about 40 years, I think 1980, after the resurrection of Christ. There were still wonderful old folk around who remembered it all, but recycling needs raw material. And that's what the written gospel contrives to give us. Until then, the scriptures were Hebrew and maybe translated into Greek, and that was that. With good reason, scholars often suggest as a catalyst for that unimaginably reckless step of writing down the gospel, the mass extinction we know as the, the sack of Jerusalem, the breaching of the seemingly eternal walls which to the disciples of Jesus had promised absolute permanence. But it's far worse than just desecration. The city was besieged during a festival and we're in Edinburgh. We know what festivals do to city populations. Casualties were catastrophic. Maybe a million dead. Anyone left was enslaved or butchered for entertainment in the arenas. I hope you're now grasping that the immediate crisis-driven interpretation of scripture makes most accessible the valuable spiritual groundwork which is what we need in the middle of crises and existential threats, which is the way the General Secretary of the United Nations describes climate change. That immediate crisis-driven resort to scripture flattens out the hills, it fills in the valleys, it installs a wheelchair ramp and a loop system, it goes on Zoom when the church is locked in, up, down or out. And that's the heart of Isaiah as hijacked by John, making God's help accessible so that we adapt, evolve and resiliently mitigate against the forces which diminish the beauty and diversity of life, including human life. So what was it against the background of Holocaust and the extirpation of the faith that Jesus loved and followed, which gave the writer of that earliest gospel the confidence to write the beginning of the good news? 
And indeed, what was good news about the small, short life of a carpenter preacher with a tendency to tell wild and scary stories in the face of an empire that was not going to collapse for another 400 years? And what can convince us that in the very real face of bad news, we are right, and if not wise, then God's right sort of holy fools to be encouraged and involved and engaged, to give thanks in all times and all circumstances. And when it's tipping down, what right do we have to be joyful, hopeful, faithful, when if you're alive, you are part of tragedy unfolding. You are already inheriting the mess you feared to leave to the grandchildren. And yet if being aware of the outlook for the world, we find hope and the possibility as members of this faith group we call the church unreasonably to keep going, then you yourself are the beginning of the good news for the world. It's so much easier for us to say that Jesus himself is the light of the world than that we, through Christ, should aspire to be the light of the earth ourselves, but that's what he said. So too, it's easier to enter into a rapture about the royal road of God rather than to gather that our way is being prepared. And precisely, it's being prepared by this transmogrification of attitude, heart, mind and more. It's easier to shuffle off onto Jesus the privilege of rule and lordship and leadership than to accept Christ leads us into unity with him. He gets us mixed up in the mess of the world. Who are our pathfinders? What groundwork is done for us? Well, in Advent readings we join with frightened people who by the grace of God found confidence not to batten down their hatches, nor even just to lament, but to cash in their treasures and seek out an experience of not so much the city, but the wild places, the wilderness, the places full of life, not intimidated by humanity, where they might recycle into their daily life John's prior recycling of the message of the multiply recycled prophet Isaiah of centuries before. John does all this by total immersion in change of mind, attitude, behaviour, in order to be liberated from the bondage of the harm we have chosen. What a joy, what a relief it can be to realise not only that you've got things wrong, but the way is wide open to put things right without wasting time on pointless vindictiveness to shoulder responsibility, to be faced with awareness of the harm we've done is surely punishment enough for those who insist on it. The blame game where punishment comes before healing, that's a luxury the world cannot afford though. People and groups and nations who cause the most damage must bear in mind that even though Jesus offers forgiveness in advance of action, it finds fruition with acknowledgement of wrong, responsibility for healing. This is good news, that it's not our perfection, independence or strength which enable justice, peace and the health of the planet. As people gather next November for COP in Glasgow, God's work will spread far wider than the crucible of the conference halls. Churches will be learning and welcoming, untied from the duty to keep things as they always have been. To build the inclusive road, we have to break new spiritual ground. So be happy. Do not worry about tomorrow, but get on with today.